Today, I'm going to tell you the story of a Maori princess. Ooh. Except that's not really a thing. <laughs> um, okay, wait, what's not? A princess isn't a real thing? A Maori princess is not really a thing. So, <laughs> okay, uh, there is a Maori king. And is he really a thing? He, he is a king. Okay. Kinda. <laughs> All right. However, it doesn't actually matter if Tupuya Harangi is a Maori princess or not, because she was one of the most important Maori leaders of the 20th century, who was really influential in what Maori culture looks like now, what Maori government looks like now, and how a Maori identity is constructed in modern New Zealand and within the New Zealand government. Wow. How interesting. I'm Katie Nelson. And I'm Olivia Mickle. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating Women You've Never Heard Of. When relations between the colonizers and the Maori in New Zealand started to really go south, in about the mid-19th century, the Maori realized, okay, apparently these people really respect royalty. And we need a royalty so that we will be able to be respected and have the same level of authority. Okay. So one of the Maori tribes decided, our leader is now a king. He is the king of the Maori. And they had a coronation ceremony and crowned him king. And he is the king. Okay. But not all Maori tribes recognize him as the king. And it is definitely not a traditional cultural Maori practice to have a king. It is not this kind of a hierarchical system. And so he is the king. Tupuya Harangi was a princess, and she is called princess, but it's not at all what Americans would think of when they think of a princess. Okay. Okay, so just to position where we are in history at this point, here's a 30-second history of New Zealand. The Maori, as far as they can tell, arrive in New Zealand before the 1300s. They're there for 300 years before Europeans make any contact at all. Captain James Cook arrives in 1769, but really there's not a whole lot of colonization happening there. Australia is established as a penal colony. They're mostly Mm -hmm. leaving New Zealand alone at this point still. Okay. And actually many of the very first European settlers in New Zealand were convicts who left Australia and went down to New Zealand to try to start over again. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. And in fact, there seems to be some agreement that in the early 1800s, they're concerned that all of these criminals escaping from Australia are corrupting the Maori. And so they said, we better hurry and make them Christian so that they are not corrupted by these terrible convicts that we brought to Australia. So they established a Christian mission in the early 1800s. New Zealand is never a penal colony, but a lot of the Australians are leaving and escaping there. So there is still that element of these are people who've been ejected from Europe who are now making the first settlements, the first colonies in New Zealand. Okay. Of course, not serious criminals. Most of the people being ejected were minor theft. Um, Right. Right. Because if you stole anything worth more than a shilling which is a pretty small amount of money uh, in today's currency, that was a capital offense and you would just be killed. So the people who were getting transported or sentenced to transportation in England um, were convicted of what we would now call petty theft or, you know, smaller crimes where today you would just be forced to pay a small fine or something like that. There were something like 170 different Mm. crimes for which you could be sentenced to transportation and be shipped to Australia. But the sentence usually wasn't a life sentence. It was maybe 7 to 14 years. And then you could have returned back home to Britain if you wanted to. But Really? Most everybody stayed. I think that they saw Australia and apparently New Zealand as having more opportunities for their future than their life back in Britain. Wow, I didn't know that. So Cook declares Australia part of the British Empire in 1770. New Zealand is not made part of the British Empire until 1840 or 1841 Hmm. um, in the Treaty of Waitangi. So in this context, they create this government that is a dual government to make sure that everyone's rights are respected. What actually begins to happen, starting in the middle of the 19th century, of course, the colonizers start to realize that the Maori have all of the best pieces of land. Right. Because they were there first, right? So they chose the best spots. Yes, exactly. So it's at this moment that Tupuya Harangi is born. 
So to learn more about her, I interviewed Dr. Gina Colvin, who is a Maori scholar and a research fellow at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. Kia ora tātou katoa, ko Gina Colvin tōku ingoa, nō Ngāti Parau me Ngā Puhi, a ka noho au ki uh, o tautahi, a nā reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. I'm Gina Colvin, I'm of New Zealand Māori descent. I have ancestral connections to both Ngāti Parau and Ngā Puhi, which are independent tribes in the North Island of New Zealand. So it's lovely to be here to have this conversation about te puia herangi. First of all, you have to teach me how to say your name. Oh, Te puia, te puia herangi. Herangi. Yes. Te puia herangi. That's right. Oh, well done. Well done, well Olivia. Not. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, Te Puia Herangi was born in 1883. And if you imagine New Zealand as the two islands, the North Island is like an upside down stingray. So you've got the Northland, which comes out like a tail, and down the bottom is is the Wellington area, which is like the head of the fish, and then you've got two wings on the east and on the west. And Te Puya was born in a place called Pirongia, which is like kind of at the at the base, not quite the tail, but at the bottom of the fish. She was what we call Waikato. She was from an area called the Waikato and the Waikato people were people that were deeply beleaguered uh, because of the richness of their land, drew lots of interest from colonists who were greedy for that area because it was so fertile. Waikato Māori had turned us into a really fertile and productive area. Somebody called the Waikato chiefs the chiefs of industry because they saw using white people's technology and colonists' technology how, how they could make money. And they did it to great effect. Of course, the government who were bringing in settlers from England saw it and thought, we want that land, we want that land for the, for the colonists, so how do we get that land? And so they spent many years after the Treaty of Waitangi, which was signed in 80, 1840, that pretty much described a bicultural nation where chiefs and uh, Māori retained their independence, and their sovereignty. But it just took about 18 months for them to, for the colonists to say, Mm, that's really inconvenient. We can't possibly have Māori being that independent and sovereign. So they started passing all of these laws. So we call it the legislative violation of Māori. And they use laws like just strange and weird makeup laws to try and get land. So if you were seen to be disloyal to the crown in any way, you could have your land confiscated. If you had dogs that were wandering the grounds without control, your land could be confiscated. So all of these, we call that the dog tax law. So all of these rules were made up and there were no people so deeply affected than the Waikato people who were largely disaffected when hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres were wrenched from them and displaced them. So you'll notice that in Gina's introduction of herself, she lists where she's from, she lists who her people are, and where her ancestors are from. And that's because land in Maori culture is not just land, it's identity. Where you are from is a huge part of who you are. Your family grouping and the village you're from are who you are. Hmm. And so when Maori people are removed from their land, it's not just that they're stealing their land, they're stealing their identity. We are the people of this mountain, and that that mountain is part of your identity. It's your cultural hmm. grounding. That's really interesting, because the same could almost be said of the British in that time period, at least the British elites, because they're named after the town they come from or the house that they live hmm. in. So, yeah. you know, you don't call him Lord Smith, you call him Lester because he's from Leicester. Right. You name them after the land that they're associated with. So it's a surprising parallel hmm. here that I see. It's kind of surprising that the British wouldn't understand that about the Maori yeah. because they did have a parallel in England at the time. Yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought of that. 
And it may be that they understood perfectly well and didn't care. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. So I wonder if this is the upper class people, maybe it's the high government level people who want that land. And because they see land as power, mm-hmm. maybe if, if the Maori are yeah. on the best land, they have the most power. Right. Yeah. And we can't have that. So they're going to take it away because land is wealth. Yeah. And status, especially, right? If they're the holders of the best, most useful land, they are going to have the most power in this government structure. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So she was born into a time at the end of that 1883, and after all of these wars and things had taken place, and she was also born into a family who in 1853 decided that they wanted to have a system of internal Māori government that matched, that paralleled the British system, what we call the Crown. Of course, it was Queen Victoria at that point, so they set up what they called the King Movement. They had a coronation in 1853 and said, okay, this family is what we call the Kahui Ariki, which is a Māori aristocracy based in Waikato. They had a number of tribes buying into that, saying, yep, that's great. If they can have the white queen in England, we can have the Māori sovereign. And so she was born into this family. And so now you have to respect our monarch if we have to respect yours, which is kind of a brilliant political move. Yeah, that seems like a clever move. Yeah. Problem is, of course, that Maori culture isn't like that, and you can't just pick one person from one area and say, he's the king of the Maori, because all the other Maori are like, we don't know that guy. Mm. He's not our king. Yeah. That these small-scale, village-level identifications are way, way, way more important. And she also grew up being a somewhat resistant to this idea of her being part of this uh, kahui ariki or this aristocracy. And she was very famously lived this desultory life as a teen, took lots of lovers, and boyfriends, etc. Had a white boyfriend called uh, Roy Seacom, I think it was, and disappeared, would have nothing to do with her family for a while while she was living this life and got coaxed out by her uncle Mahuta who had seen in her all of these qualities of leadership and really wanted her back for her people. It's a big question that she had to ask herself, like, do I really want to be in service of my people knowing how bad it is or can I just live this life in the city? So it was a very beleaguered area for Māori. So white farmers, et cetera, doing really, really well, but Māori are not. So eventually, I mean, she obviously eventually did come back and take on this responsibility, but she seems to have been uneasy with that, that she rejected this title of princess that people would try to put on her, and she was really sort of trying to live between two worlds. Yeah, very much so. It seems to me that she was not a person who made apologies very well. But she was determined and dogged. But it was a heavy burden for her, I think. It was a heavy burden for her to take the kind of responsibility that her people needed her to take. And not something that sat easily, but she's also one of those people who's a person of principle. So once she decided that she was going to do it, she was going to do it with generosity and fierceness. But having said that, it's not something that I think that she was, she particularly welcomed. Which is, I think, is a great sign of leadership. What do you think she saw as her main responsibility? What was she trying to accomplish? She has this great conversation with one of the prime ministers, Peter Fraser, I think, who made an accusation about her and said that she was against Pākehā, white people. And she said, no, I'm not. I'm for Māori. And this isn't to say that I believe in separatism or segregation. But what she was saying is, I will always back Māori. You need to understand that. When push comes to shove, Māori will be first. Now, this doesn't mean to say that we can't live a life um, where we actually learn from each other. But if you're going to ask me to choose sides, it will always be the Māori side. You know, there are a lot of people that made concessions, and we have this great word for people who sell out to Pakias, and it's called kupapa. And the kupapa are ones that see actually this advantage sidling up to or glad handing the, the colonists. 
And there were a lot of concessions made. My tribe were produced a lot of kūpapa, but she was not a kūpapa. But, you know, she was, a, she was a child of her times also. So she had been around during a period where there had been, you know, several generations of Pākehā or colonists in New Zealand. She knew the world. I mean, she was an English speaker. She was educated at Mercer Primary School. And so she knew this white colonial world. She was familiar with it. But having said that, that made her familiar enough to understand its limitations. One of the things that I think is the most wonderful thing that she did, that she rejected conscription of the Waikato men to the World War I. Basically, her argument was, why would we fight a battle that's not ours? And why would we fight alongside a group of people who fought us? And this caused a lot of suffering for the Waikato men who were taken into military training and given really, really harsh treatment. And she'd go up and sit outside their camp, just there as moral support. So she was really awesome like that. So that is a good example of who she is, I think. She's strategic, she's clever, but she's also really compassionate. And this personal touch, she doesn't, you know, she didn't have to go sit there. She could have sent letters. She spends her time and energy and emotional labor of sitting there and looking at her people and making sure they know that she's aware of what's going on, that she cares, that she is present, literally, for this abuse that's happening to them. Wow. Leadership. Yeah. A completely different face of leadership. She was also really good at establishing marae. Marae are essential spaces for Māori. And these are places in which pictures of our deceased ancestors or carvings, what we call popo, of connections, important tribal connections that tell the story. So when you walk into this, it's like a body. You're kind of walking into, like I say, liminal space. You know, at one end, people's umbilical cords are buried to signify connection with land and place and ongoing humanity, but also with the ancestors. At the other end is the opening, the waha, in which the deceased cannot pass through because this is where you hold funerals. You take the coffins, you don't pass them through the door, you pass them through the window, just like a birth. So there are all sorts of really powerful spiritual meanings. And this is where funerals are held. This is where family gatherings are held, where weddings are held. So to re-establish a place for the white castle people to, to establish you know, a centre, in many respects, it's a heartbeat. It's where a community life is created. You know, people's lives begin and end at this really powerful place. So for her to create something so powerful, and it wasn't just the Carved Meeting House, but also that it was, it, she has re-established a village life, a kind of cooperative and economic life. I think that was her biggest concern, that people would lose their sense of identity and culture. So I think she put the heart back into Waikato. She was fiercely concerned about the economic prosperity of her people. So she establishes a new place north of Hamilton called uh, Narua Wahia. She establishes an economic centre for the Kingitanga, for the King Movement. And there she has working farms, etc., etc., to pay for people's livelihoods. So she had economic and also political and cultural now. So she was really clever in the way that she was able to spread herself across those three really important domains. I think it really demonstrates too the way that she is bringing together these two things. You know, she is passionately devoted to revitalizing Maori culture, to protecting their traditional beliefs, cultures, practices from erasure. Yeah with this colonizing force coming in. But as soon as it becomes apparent that this new economy is based in something completely different, she changes. She says, all right, great. If farms are how all of these colonizers are making money, Mm -hmm. then we will have farms. Because if that's what we need to do to compete economically now, we will do that. And she immediately establishes these large farms, but they are communal farms. So she's combining both of those things. She is keeping the Maori value of Mm -hmm. communal order while embracing the new technology of farming, of sheep. 
Yeah, because you can't freeze your culture in time right. while the rest of the world moves on. Nobody can successfully do that. Yeah, and I think, you know, we in the present, we tend to want to look back and identify real culture. What was the real Maori culture? What was the real Navajo culture? Yeah. You know, it, especially with indigenous mm -hmm. people point. that we colonized, we said, but when was it pure and real? Yeah. And that's an insane idea. Right. Uh, you know, you as you said, you can't freeze your culture in time. And we we wouldn't require, you know, like we want to go back and say, all right, 1642, that is when a European arrived in New Zealand. That was pure untouched Maori culture. Right. But we're not expecting ourselves like right we don't say to be a true american right you should dress in george 18, washington's 12. clothes <laughs> yeah <laughs> whatever year we pick right we don't say to be properly british you must have dickensian clothing exactly and you know like on a personal level we don't say katie and i should dress in danish clothing from 1868, because that is the moment when our ancestors moved and were corrupted by American culture. I don't know what year yeah. it is, but whatever year that our Danish ancestor right. left Denmark, that was real. And we should wear the pointy shoes and the, uh, that would be asinine right. to say. And yet we continually want to impose that on indigenous cultures, mm -hmm. that somehow they are not real and we are real. We can move and change, and they have to be frozen in amber at the point of contact. So, I mean, in many respects, she doesn't, when you think about women and women's history, she is sexually promiscuous, fiercely independent. She was never able to have children, but she ended up fostering about 100 orphans whose parents had died because of the 1918 influenza epidemic. So she was really big hearted in that way. But she isn't the type of woman that we celebrate because she is in her own skin. And this is, you know, this is why I find compelling as a Maori woman that there aren't all of these qualifications for virginity or for deference or submission. It's just that she is just very fierce and compassionate at the same time. She holds that gorgeous balance between the two. I found that interesting. The Encyclopedia of New Zealand just lays out sort of her early life in a very practical, non-judgmental way. And whoever it was that wrote this line in the Wikipedia page about her had to specify that she later regretted those choices to be promiscuous. And <laughs> there's no, then there's no citation. They're just like, no, but she was sorry later. So that we still are trying to squash her into this archetype. Well, I mean, if she was a good, powerful woman, she must have repented of her evil, wild ways. And it made me laugh. Yeah, I don't understand that because Maori women are very much sex positive and always have been. It's just with colonization and Christian, the Christianization that infected that sex positivity with a sense of shame. But all in all, Maori women aren't particularly concerned with these Victorian ideals of sexuality. Still yeah. not. <laughs> I mean, New Zealand is one of the first independent nations or sovereign nations in the world to offer women the uh, vote. So in terms of gender egalitarianism, it is very progressive. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the bones of this nation. Mm. And it has a lot to do with Maori women also. also. It also has a lot to do with miscegenation. That unlike other nations, colonists came in and they started marrying Maori women. So miscegenation has, has, I mean, like literally brought Māori and Pākehā into bed with each other. Mm. And Māori women tend not to become the bubble and squeak. Americans don't know what that means. All right. <laughs> <laughs> bubble and squeak is the leftovers that you just put in a pan and cook with butter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Māori women tend to be very forthright, always, always have been. So I think that sort of created a cultural difference from a lot of nations. 
So what do you think she would think about the way things are in New Zealand now? I, th- I think there would be an, a, an element of disappointment that there have been so many concessions to the government. <sighs> yeah, I think New Zealand lives in an age where I think many of our, what we call our runanga, uh, like our tribal committees, have been actually co-opted by the government. And we've sort of lost that hard edge of defiance. In an age where uh, these runanga, they've got money, and so they become corporatized, very corporatized. And the more pressing issue of revitalization and cultural reclamation has somewhat been put to the side. I think that she would be proud of the education system and that we have a, like a very strong Māori immersion option in our education. I think she would be very excited about how many Māori actually in, in Parliament and how many Māori women. So I... I Yeah, maybe there would be a bit of dismay over the lack of the use of the language. So all the music in this episode actually is provided by a Maori Immersion School. Cool! All of the cultural skills that Topoya was worried about losing are coming back. So this music that you're listening to throughout the episode is the Maori Revival. This is the next generation embracing the language, the skills, the music, the culture. So I wanted to make sure to highlight that because I think it's really exciting. That's awesome. If she were born now, if she were living now, do you think that her impact would be the same or have things changed enough that she would be a different kind of leader or she wouldn't be effective as a leader or she'd be more effective? Yeah, that's a hard question. I mean, the King movement continues. We we have currently have a Maori King who's part of that same family. Is um, he's too hatier? I mean, I yeah, it would be great to bring her actually to tidy things up and be quite noisily tidy things up. Mm. Yeah, I think we've in this era of diplomacy where the idea of biculturalism has been co-opted by white people. I, and I need to explain that in New Zealand, the government aspiration is for biculturalism. And that is the two cultural, Māori and Pākehā, informing each other in an age of multiculturalism. So it's a very diverse community, but biculturalism is the flagship. But what's happened is that, in many respects, Pākehā have come to define what Māori culture is or what a good approach to Māori culture, which is always very soft and and kind of nubile and it's lost its hard edges. And so Māori and, and, and protest are very fierce and uncompromising. But as Pākehā have picked this up, it's become, you need to be, we need to be loving and hospitable. So they've taken all the kind of Christianized mm. aspects of Māori culture and turned it against many Māori. You know, people like me who are quite fierce about things. I don't look to be culturally competent because I'm not being nice. <laughs> sure, that's a classic historical move. Yeah. That's been used since 380 CE. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I'd i love someone like Te Pui Hirangi to come in and say, you go, girl. <laughs> <laughs> so you sort of mentioned in passing she fostered 100 children. That's kind of a big deal. Yes. What does that look like? It's huge. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I fostered four. And right. That's, that's why when pretty... I read this, I thought, hey. <laughs> Um, I think she brought them to Ngaro Wahia and she wanted them and she adopted quite a number of these children and sent them to schools, sent them to, to, to be educated. But I think when she set up the centre in Ngaro Wahia, she wanted good housing and to be able to house these young folk who were parentless. Hmm. So it seems also like a different approach than maybe would have been taken by English colonisers that it seems to have been a communal we're all just as a community going to raise these children instead of separating the kids and sending them out to different families all over. Yeah, I, that, I mean, that's really been the way that Māori deal with their kids. Mm. So in English, we t- well, in, in the English culture or white culture, we talk about adoption and fostering. Mm. And yeah, you're right, the, you know, the system comes in and disperses them. But in Māori, it's let's keep them all together. And we call it whāngai, which is we feed them. Mm. So they'll be whāngai children, which the designation in the English system is given based on their abandonment. So, um, you know, foster children are often abandoned or neglected or orphan children, their parents have died. But the Māori version is these are children who need to be fed by the Mm. community. Our 
are there specific moments or things in her life that you find really compelling or interesting? Yeah, I want to know what she's doing when she's a teenager, a young person. I find that really, really, and it's such an anti-story, isn't it? Like from all of the stories that we're given as colonized people about this woman, her success is contingent upon keeping herself pure and virginal, but this is her actually just going wild and still being this amazing leader. I find that really, really compelling because in many respects, there's no place for that in, in our like religious narratives and our cultural narratives that we live with. And that it demonstrates sort of her unwillingness to take direction from men or be obedient or subservient to men. Just, nope, this is what I want to do. Yep, absolutely. And that's so Marty woman. <laughs> what I want to do. When she returns, that she is sort of coaxed by her uncle. There isn't a, you have to come back and do this. It does seem to have been a conversation. And when she makes that decision, it's her own decision. It's yes. not just, this is what I have to do. It's, this is the right thing to do. Yeah, but it's an interesting cultural observation. Because Māori, we have the saying called, Ko te reo te kaya te rangatira, which means that the language is the food of chiefs. And this is to say that the more that you can language something in a compelling way, the more convincing you're going to be. You don't force people into things. The heart of the language system, which was always paint a beautiful picture with your language and with your words, make it compelling, give it depth and give it breadth. And people will, will enter into this web, not through compulsion, but because you have given them something intoxicating, something that they couldn't have otherwise. So leadership and language are always really important. Not leadership and power, but leadership and language. So this completely different way of leading that you have to make people feel understood, that you have to reach them on a personal level and that you will never be able to command or order or even inspire in the way that we would think about it. You can't convince them that you're right by arguing. You have to hmm. understand them first and then create a circumstance in which they are able to understand you. Hmm. And all of that happens through language. So that's fascinating to me. Yeah, that's the kind of leader I want. It's such a different idea, helping people to come into an idea instead of pushing other people out of your rhetorical space. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And in many respects, that's that's part of it. It's like if the speechmaker or the rangatira or the leader is to convince you, then they need to convince that they understand you and your people. So we have this other saying called kamua kamuri, which is we go into the future looking backwards. So you cannot mm. paint a picture of the future without folding in the history, the depth of a people and their culture. Which brings us to our most important conversation. Okay. We're here, two white women in America, having a conversation about this Maori woman whose entire life was dedicated to making sure that Maori stories and Maori values and Maori culture were not filtered through a European understanding, hmm. that they remained what they were, and that while she might bring in all kinds of European technology, European improvements, the culture remains intact and it remains in the hands of Maori, which even the way that we're talking about it right now, I'm probably talking about that wrong because my understanding of what that means is completely different and I am unable to shift myself right. because no one is able to shift themselves out of the mindset and the viewpoint that they are raised with. So here we are having a conversation about how she didn't want us <laughs> to do the thing that we're doing, probably. Would she prefer that we not talk about her or that only Maori talk about her? I don't think so. And here is why her biography was written by a white New Zealander. He was a historian who came in and was really interested and wrote her biography. And even in that moment, it was very controversial. Mm -hmm. But they're also fully aware that this is how your story is told mm -hmm. in this new society. So many people were upset that he wrote her biography, but her family and her community provided all of the resources for him to do that. 
Yes, Michael King has been a prolific New Zealand historian and there was some controversy over him writing a Māori woman's and they call it like a tapu person, like a mm. sacred person's um, history. But he's done amazing things. I mean, his, his work isn't beyond reproach, but it's still, he's been like a soldier, a warrior for Māori history. And so he wrote her history, which um, I thought was compelling. He's very v- rigorous. Te Puya died in 1952, and this is after a similar resistance to New Zealand Māori troops being involved in World War II. Um, I think she'd had tuberculosis that had kind of had got ongoing effects, but she'd always been this luminous figure, somebody that you couldn't look beyond, you couldn't undermine, you couldn't ignore. She had done so much and had lived so fully this life of political and cultural and economic revitalization, reformation, reclamation for her people. And I'm not sure at her death that she was particularly happy with the life that she'd lived. <laughs> I mean, there's part of her that was always a little bit miserable about it. Because <laughs> she wanted that other life, maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe she wanted a private life. I mean, every indication is when she rejected everybody and cut herself from her, from her family, that, that that was a strain or like a need in her in some ways. And it's not easy for Māori to reject their family and to do it so obviously and so declaratory. So there was always that. And I'm, I'm really conscious of that being an impulse in her life that she had to constantly override. So I imagine that brought her, you know, like a strain of sadness. So, Katie, I know you and I have talked about this before, this Japanese idea that what you create with your life is your ultimate work of art. Uh Uh-huh. So I asked Gina Colvin what she thought would be Tapuya Harangi's work of art. What was it that she created? And I found her answer really fascinating and really beautiful and really moving. Well, I think if you if I have an image that comes to my mind when I think of a work of art, I think of uh, Fari Fakairo, which is a carved meeting house. And carved meeting houses are really important threshold spaces between the living and the dead. And so there are spiritual, there are traditional and customary ways that you bring people into those into those physical spaces that acknowledge both parts of our identity, parts of our identity that held in the past and our ancestors and in their deaths and and what happens in the future. But they are beautiful and they're ornate and across the walls are carved statues to past ancestors that tell a story of what we need to understand for the future. And I think when I think of her, I think of this beautiful mahinarangi, I think it's the marae or Fari Fakairo, the carved meeting house that they have in Ngaroa here. I think of that, I think of the gorgeousness of that space as a real symbol of her life. It was an acknowledgement of both parts of what Māori have had to deal with, with this past that calls them and compels them, but this future that needs to be lived into. Thank you to Dr. Gina Colvin, and special thanks to Natasha Sadler. Music for this episode was provided by Mahanga Pihama, Mitotangi Vale Smith Peke, Yavin Rivers Hall, Scarlet Manners de Pania, and Tanifa, and the Rohu Kapahaka o Te Kurikaupapa Māori o Hwani Waititi. If you'd like to see pictures or learn more about the musicians featured in this episode or about Topuya Hirangi herself, please visit our website at whatsyournamepodcast.com. If you enjoyed this episode, we encourage you to leave a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. It's the best way for us to reach more people. And if you'd like to help support more women's history and more episodes of this podcast, please visit our website and click donate. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Smith. This episode was edited by Olivia Mickle, and What's Her Name is produced by Olivia Mickle and Katie Nelson. 